All right. Hello and welcome everyone to the uh, second Leading with Justice speaker series. Uh, real quick before we get started, a couple of uh, minor announcements and housekeeping. Uh, first, uh, if anyone would like to share an interesting or engaging quote of the day, we would love it if you would share that with us on social media using the hashtag, hashtag leading with justice. Also, a couple of quick announcements. Uh, the webinar is being recorded. You probably had to accept that when you started. Uh, we are going to have a Q&A section for folks to ask questions. That is in the specific Q&A box. And then if you have technical issues or support concerns, please add that to the chat. We aren't going to be taking questions in the chat area. That is only going to be in the Q&A section. We do have ASL interpreters and a closed captioner. If you'd like to turn closed captions on, please uh, click the CC button. That's probably at the bottom of the Zoom window. And then um, there's some notes for changing the view option. If you want to see the ASL interpreter larger on the screen right now, I'm going to copy those and add them to the chat box as well for further review. And with that, I would like to introduce Dr. Lisa Romero. Welcome to Sacramento State's Doctorate in Educational Leadership Leading with Justice Speaker Series. I'm Lisa Romero. I'm a professor in the EDD program. And I'm so pleased to have the opportunity to introduce you to Assemblyman Jose Medina. Assemblymember Medina is with us today to talk about his, re his work in the California State Assembly. Mr. Medina represents the 61st Assembly District, which falls in Riverside County, and currently serves as the chair of the Assembly Committee on Higher Education. Before his election to the Assembly, Mr. Medina was a longtime public high school teacher he served as a K-12 school board member and a community college board trustee. As a former educator, Mr. Medina cares deeply about education and works to champion policies that improve the lives of students across the state. Few people have both the breadth of knowledge and the firsthand experience across K-12 and the community college policy spectrum that assembly member Medina has. One of the reasons we're excited to have Mr. Medina join us today is because he has been a champion of ethnic studies programs in California public schools. I asked Mr. Medina to make a few opening comments and then I'm going to turn the program over to our doctorate and educational leadership students who have some questions from assembly member Medina beginning with ethnic studies and then moving on to a few other topics. The last 15 minutes of our time together are reserved for questions from you, the audience. Those that are joining us in the audience, please type your questions in the Q&A box. We will get to as many questions as possible. So now I am so pleased and honored to introduce assembly member, Jose Medina. Well, thank you, Dr. Romero. And thank you to the students uh, who are on uh, with me this morning. It really is an honor to be in front of you uh, to answer questions and to talk a little bit about ethnic studies. Okay, we're gonna start with our first student now. So good morning, buenos dias, assembly member Jose Medina. My name is Ana Segoviano, first year in the doctoral program. I'm part of cohort 14. I am a third year Spanish teacher at Mesa Verde High School in the San Juan Unified School District. Our first question today is, you have been an abiding passion for ethnics. You have an abiding passion for ethnic studies. In fact, many would say that this is one of your signature legislative efforts. Can you tell us why? Why is ethnic studies so important? Well, I think as Dr. Romero uh, said in the introduction, I, I was a longtime teacher here in Riverside at Riverside Poly High School. Uh, and when I started teaching there, um, I, I, I saw, you know, kind of a hunger for students, for uh, information, for knowledge uh, about their, their, their own, uh, where they come from, their own past, their own history, their own culture. And I, I saw that in teaching a U.S. history class uh, over the summer. And when I was able to bring in topics that related more closely to my students' background, uh, a lot of them Latino, um, 
I saw, I saw them light up. I, I saw them uh, really become engaged. And then when I had the opportunity uh, later on, a few years later, to teach Chicano studies and to teach ethnic studies, again, I had the same uh, experience uh, directly, seeing students really become engaged in a way that they hadn't been before uh, when, when the curriculum reflected uh, their own cultures, their own past. Um, so it was that personal experience uh, that I saw with my own students um, over the years. Uh, when I left teaching and got elected to the legislature, those very same students would see me in the street in uh, Riverside, and they would come up to me and thank me again for what they had learned in my Chicano studies class and my ethnic studies class. So when I got to Sacramento and we started talking about ethnic studies and then uh, assembly member Luis Alejo introduced legislation that would develop um, an ethnic studies curriculum. I, I, I thought, well, you know, it would be a shame to have a curriculum and not have it uh, included. Uh, so it was with that that I introduced uh, AB 331 to make ethnic studies a high school graduation requirement. Thank you um, for your response, Assembly Member Medina. Good morning, Assembly Member. My name is Eric Ramirez. I am the program coordinator of the Dreamer Resource Center at Sac State. Um, and I am a first year uh, doctoral student in cohort 14. Uh, the next question is, it's easy for Latinx or African American communities to see the importance of ethnic studies. Why is it important for all students, regardless of race, race or ethnicity, to engage in ethnic studies courses? And then speaking to the parents of California students and the broader community, why is this important for the entire community and what would all Californians, Californians gain? Well, one, one of the uh, uh, authors that I relied on when I was teaching uh, ethnic studies uh, at Riverside Poly High School in Riverside was a, a historian at Cal Berkeley by the name of Ronald Takaki. And Ronald Takaki writes much about the diverse ethnic history of the United States. And in one of his books, he starts with an incident that happened that he experienced. And he, he's on his way to Washington, DC to uh, give a presentation. And the uh, taxi driver that picks him up at the airport uh, asks him, where is he from? And he is impressed by how well he speaks English. And so Ronald Takaki uh, from that incident, you know, talks about what is it to be an American? and who do we uh, look upon as Americans? And, and unfortunately, uh, I, I think I have even felt uh, in my own life, in my own experience, uh, and like many other immigrants or, or people who come from uh, immigrant uh, history, that we are not seen sometimes even as, as Americans. Uh, and so, if we are indeed all of us uh, Americans, no matter where our families may have come from, and indeed we are, uh, it, it's important that all Americans know the history and a very complex history that we've had uh, in this country, in the state of California, because as Ronald Takaki said, without that, it's an incomplete history. And so I also think that it is just something that everyone should know and have a knowledge base uh, of, of other people, of other groups. Um, and I think it would help us in, in better understanding each other if we know where we came from. And with that, uh, hopefully getting along better. Uh, so definitely ethnic studies is not just for students of color, but is for all students. Thank you, Assembly Member. Hi, Assemblymember Medina. Uh, my name is Gabby Ballesteros. I am a member of cohort 13, so I'm a second year doctoral student, and I am the Greek advisor slash student life program coordinator at San Francisco State University. 
Um, so our next question for you is, one of the points of discussion in our policy course is about policy windows or windows of opportunity for policy that open and close. It seemed like this was the year for ethnic studies, an idea whose time had finally come. In August, uh, AB 1460, Assemblymember Weber's bill requiring ethnic studies as a CSU graduation requirement passed and was signed by Governor Newsom. A few weeks later, your bill, AB 331, making ethnic studies a high school graduation requirement passed but was vetoed by the governor. Why do you think that is? And what can you tell us about this particular policy window and what should we look for going forward? Well, thank you, Gabriela. I think that's a, a great question and a great way to, uh, to look at it, about windows of opportunity uh, for legislation and policy. And indeed, it was or is uh, a, a window of opportunity. Um, certainly what happened uh, with the murder of George Floyd and Black Lives Matter created uh, some, an opportunity that we hadn't seen in the United States and in California in a long time. And, and the uh, protests of young people day after day across the United States certainly raised an awareness and uh, activism, an awareness of racism that had not been, uh, I had not seen you know, since the early 1960s. So indeed, this has been uh, a window of opportunity for public policy. We saw uh, police reform bills pass uh, the legislature and get the governor's signature. As you said, Gabriela, Dr. Weber's bill making ethnic studies uh, was signed by the governor, making it a requirement for CSU for graduation. So there, there had been this great opportunity uh, to also get ethnic studies as a high school graduation requirement. We, and we saw, and I would point out, that we've seen throughout the state of California, district after district, on their own, uh, making ethnic studies a graduation requirement. Uh, my own Riverside Unified very recently uh, made ethnic studies a high school graduation requirement. And we saw many other districts like that. And so many people were surprised by the governor's veto. Uh, I, I said that I was somewhat surprised. And I would point out that in the governor's veto, he pointed to the, uh, uh, his uh, still a dissatisfaction, uncertainty with the curriculum. And there were uh, different groups that contacted the governor, uh, asking uh, the governor not to sign it. Uh, but since the governor's veto, the governor has reached out to me. Um, and we've had a short conversation where the governor indicates to me that he has ever, every intention uh, and wants to see me get another bill to him next year, a bill that he can and wants to sign. So I, I hope and I think that the window is still open and I know uh, that there is much passion and, and a desire to have ethnic studies in California. And one thing that I said to the media was that in this state, the most diverse state in the nation, uh, we need to have it in our ability to create ethnic studies. If, if we can't do it in California, you know, how can we expect other states uh, to do it? California needs to be a leader in this. Thank you so much for sharing. Hello, Assemblymember Medina. I am Amber Bradley. I'm a social science teacher in West Sacramento, and I am a second year doctoral student. Our next question for you. The Wall Street Journal recently called ethnic studies curriculum anti-American and Marxist indoctrination. We have recently heard similar rhetoric coming from the White House regarding anti-racist curriculum. How would you respond to such strong criticism and how do you proceed in this era of such strong divide? Right. Well, certainly we've all seen uh, uh, Trump's uh, you know, statements on, on uh, having the government uh, get, move away from uh, you know, diversity, anti-racism training. And so when the governor did veto it, I said, well, you know, that this had been a lost opportunity to push back on the rhetoric of Trump, Trump's rhetoric. Um, to the Wall Street Journal, I, I, I think I take it as a badge of honor that the Wall Street Journal will, would 
editorialize so strongly against a bill that I introduced. Uh, as far as indoctrination or Marxist indoctrination, you know, I think that all our classes that, that we teach in the state of California are meant to teach students to think and to think for themselves. And ethnic studies will be no different or should be no different. Uh, and there will be no indoctrination, quote unquote, uh, in ethnic studies. Um, I think they were perhaps uh, reacting to some of the uh, curriculum in the first draft as it pertained to, to capitalism. But ethnic studies is um, much needed and will allow students to think in a way that uh, students want to be able to to examine and they have not been able to because they haven't been offered this kind of classes before. I, I think ethnic studies, you know, also will ask students to think critically and not just accept uh, one version of history as it's been presented uh, in the past. I think uh, Takaki talks about the dominant narrative. And so ethnic studies gets away from a dominant narrative. Uh, Dr. Carlos Cortez, here at UC Riverside talked about history always presented as a east to west, um, that it only happened from east to west. And I would argue that things like Angel Island uh, are just as important as Ellis Island and the history of Native Americans and the genocide of Native Americans uh, needs to be taught. That uh, the prejudice against Asian Americans in things like the alien land law that didn't allow for a Japanese to own property uh, need to be learned. Thank you for that. We're gonna switch gears to the election of 2020 next. So our next question, we have a big election coming up. If Biden wins the presidential election, do you have any thoughts about the next Secretary of Education? What kinds of qualifications would you be looking for? Well, I certainly think that one of the qualifications is to understand public, uh, public schools. And certainly the Trump's uh, selection for Secretary of Education didn't seem to demonstrate uh, a basic understanding of the public schools uh, in the United States. So I would look for the Secretary of Education to be a leader in education. And uh, when I saw that question uh, that, that the students uh, had, had brought for my consideration, uh, one name, comes to my mind, and that is the uh, present president of the State Board of Education, um, Governor Gavin Newsom's uh, selection, and that is Professor Dr. Linda Darling Hammond of, of Stanford University. Uh, she is a leader in the United States. She'd been an advisor, I believe, to uh, uh, President, maybe then candidate, uh, Barack Obama, but I think someone of Linda Darling Hammond's caliber would be a great secretary of education. Thank you, assembly member. Uh, the next question is about higher education and your role as chairman of the assembly higher education committee. So numerous news sources have uh, been talking about additional costs for universities to safely reopen with COVID-19. And at the same time that California and states across the nation are facing significant budget shortfalls. How will California provide the necessary resources to keep students and faculty safe? Well, the impact of COVID-19 to higher education has certainly uh, been both an educational challenge and a financial challenge to all segments of higher education from community college to the CSU to UC, to private institutions. Uh, I, I will convene a hearing um, next month on just that, on the educational and fiscal impact of COVID-19 on the four different segments of higher education. Um, as, as I talk to uh, professors, um, including as recently as this morning, uh, you know, I hear from professors uh, some of their own uh, um, anxieties, frustration of having, you know, of 
of being in this mode. I, I, I shared with uh, uh, Professor Ron Loveridge this morning, uh, as he's tried to share with me, you know, how he'd been a professor for some 50 some years, and now uh, facing the challenge of learning how to try to do things remotely, that the teachers, and also had that same conversation this morning with another teacher, you know, teachers, I think, like you, like uh, myself, you know, we became teachers because we like the personal interaction. So it's, it's very much an educational challenge. Uh, and the physical challenge has been also great. The loss of revenue uh, that the campuses are experiencing from not having students on campus, uh, leading to layoffs, budget cuts, uh, have been severe. And how the state is gonna uh, react to that uh, is certainly something that is on our agenda. Uh, I serve on subcommittee two, the budget committee for education and uh, assembly member Kevin McCarty of Sacramento uh, will be joining me in the hearing to look at what, what is the future uh, for higher education in this uh, time of COVID-19 and distance learning. It certainly challenges ahead, uh, very serious challenges. And, and I think all campuses are struggling to how they're gonna meet those, uh, that, those uh, fiscal challenges. Thank you again for sharing. Um, so we're gonna move to Q&A, so questions from the audience for you. Um, so I'm gonna start with the first question that has been submitted. Um, so it's, I love your experience as an ethnic studies teacher. What are two to three pieces of information that you learned through an ethnic studies curriculum that impacted you? What are some gems you would teach to your students? Well, most of everything uh, that, that, that we did was, was greatly appreciated. Um, you know, my teacher, using my teacher hat. One, one of the things that, you know, I was kind of almost surprised by how well students reacted to was uh, we illustrated poems, poems by different uh, Latino, African-American uh, authors. And they did little, little, little booklets uh, just illustrating the poem kind of line by line and and students were so creative and got got into it so much that it was impressive it was impressive the work they did uh, how they could take a poem a single poem and line by line uh, kind of show illustrate uh, the significance of that poem to them and what a, a, a short poem uh, can mean that 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 was something that was uh, successful in my class. Um, research, you know, I, I had students, I had two students uh, who entered the Cesar Chavez scholarship that is put on by the California Teachers Association and actually won scholarships awarded by the California Teachers Association. I have a painting that sits right here in my house in my ha hallway uh, by a student of mine. Um, and it is a painting of Cesar Chavez's face uh, painted as a mountain. Uh, and when that student brought that painting in, I said, wow, this is a winner. You know, but this was a, a student and she happened to be a Korean American student who, who you know, learned about Cesar Chavez, who learned about what Cesar Chavez meant to uh, farm workers and was able to make a painting of Cesar Chavez that showed the importance of his work and the significance of Cesar Chavez. So when students are given opportunities like that, they shine, they really shine. And um, you know, students never fail to amaze me, but what, what they can do. Governor Brown uh, vetoed ethnic studies bill before Gavin Newsom. And in his one sentence veto message, he said that students have already too much on their plate. Well, I disagree with Governor Brown. You know, I disagree. Students rise to the occasion and uh, ethnic studies will certainly give them that uh, opportunity. Thank you. Uh, our next question is, we are coming up on an election unlike pretty much any in our lifetime and our nation needs to heal from the past several years. 
what steps should we all take to make our nation one? It seems, it seems like it is everyone's responsibility to heal. Yeah. I, I remember my own personal <clears throat> disappointment and, and almost fear that came the day after the election. I remember walking out of my house and my neighbors coming and, you know, my neighbors kind of uh, embracing each other uh, the day after the election. Four years ago, I, I had requests from students at the community college and public school students who expressed their fear their fear of you know coming home and not finding a parent uh, the next day or that day after coming from school. Um, the rhetoric that Trump used in his campaign when he launched his uh, campaign, when he talked about Mexicans as being drug smug smugglers and rapists, um, we saw after that, and we continue to see the rise of hate crimes throughout the United States. The things like the plot of kidnapping a governor, those are real uh, threats, real threats to, to people, to our democracy. I have never in my lifetime uh, seen anything like what we've experienced in the last four years. And as a teacher, I know that what happens in the highest levels of government, whether it be Washington, D.C., or Sacramento, uh, seeps down into the classroom and into the schools. Um, we've seen in the schools, including right here in Riverside, uh, hate, students posing with Confederate flags, swastikas, Trump flags, you know, swastikas drawn on campuses. There, there is much to do. There is much to do in the next four years uh, to try to bring this country together. And it's certainly something that it is gonna be needed to work on for quite a while. Yes, thank you very much. Um, our next question is in regards to your bill. Um, so what curriculum, cons what curriculum concerns will be addressed in the rewrite? Well, I, I would point out that, you know, that the bill is different from the curriculum itself. So, I think the governor had an uh, issue was with the curriculum. Um, I, I am in pretty close conversation with our state superintendent of schools, um, Tony Thurman. And um, he, has, he has in front of him a pretty difficult, challenging task, as we've seen, to come up with a curriculum uh, that the governor wants to see balanced, and at the same time, maintaining the integrity of what is ethnic studies. And, and we have seen, you know, an outpouring of, from different groups uh, saying that, you know, that they should be uh, included. But at, at some point, uh, not everything can be included. Uh, you know, we're talking about a semester class, 18 weeks, and it would be impossible to teach the history of every single group in the state of California. Uh, so these are, you know, kind of difficult discussions and decisions that are going to have to be made. Um, but I have confidence that uh, that we can get it done. Uh, I have confidence in State Superintendent Tony Thurman and the President of uh, the State Board of Education, Linda Darling Hammond. The timeline is to have the curriculum done by March of next year. Uh, and so it will be a different, I think, scenario next year. Uh, the curriculum should be in place by the time the bill comes to the governor's desk. As he indicated to me in his text message, uh, he looks forward to having a bill that he can sign. Thank you. Um, our next question. In their now classic work, Tayek and Cuban propose that reform in public education is often accomplished by tinkering toward an always improved system. Is there any aspect of public education that you would propose needs more than tinkering, but a wholesale overhaul? Well, um, you know, equity in education, I think, is a theme that we've had for a long time. We talk about the, the, uh, the gap 
in, in, in uh, achievement, the achievement gap. And, and equity is something that has been discussed in education for a long time. Um, and, and certainly, you know, we move towards, we should be moving towards that, uh, you know, that, those results, those goals. But, but how we get there, I think there's many different facets that, that could help us to get there. Curriculum is one, you know, what do we teach? The other one, I think, is who are the teachers? And I think that, that also uh, Tony Thurman has made it a priority to work on diversifying the teaching force. And uh, I think that is certainly needed because we see uh, direct evidence that having more teachers that reflect the diversity of the students themselves, whether it be in the K-12 or in the higher education, makes a difference in student achievement. So I, I, I think that all those different things uh, that need to be worked on to close the, well, and I, I don't even know that I like the idea of, uh, of the achievement gap, but more to make education uh, more equitable are, are, are things that need to be worked on. Thank you. Um, so the next question, given its controversial beginnings, leadership turnover and the recent legislative audit of Calbright, does the state need a separate online only community college? Interesting question, Anna. My wife asked me about that this morning at breakfast. Uh, we were talking about that. Uh, yesterday, I had a conversation with the San Jose Community College District. Um, you, you may be aware that I have asked and had an audit on Calbright uh, that we're going to be hearing in January. Uh, we, we spoke uh, very forcefully about getting rid of Cal Calbright funding altogether. Um, the governor chose not to defund Calbright completely. Uh, it was cut back but it still had some funding. Uh, but as, as my wife pointed out at breakfast this morning, with now every single district, uh, community college district in the state of California uh, doing distance learning, is there really a need uh, for Calbright? I think not. I, I spoke on the assembly floor uh, suggesting that we not, you not give any funding to Calbright. But as I said, I had asked for an audit and we will get the results of that audit uh, presented to us, I believe, in January. But I, I think it is a duplication. I think they were having, like you pointed out, on a very many challenges. Um, when, when it was proposed, there, there was a, a supposedly a certain niche that they have. I, they've enrolled so few students. I'll be uh, looking forward to hearing the results of the audit. I, I think uh, money uh, could be better used elsewhere in higher education. Thank you for that. Your committee has an agenda of higher education. What can you tell us about the legislative plans? Right, I, 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 I saw a question of asking what, what would we be doing differently had it not been for COVID-19? And you're probably aware that uh, Assemblymember McCarty, myself, and Senator Leva uh, had a bill to reform um, student aid. And it is something that hadn't been done, uh, I think, in the last 30 years or so. You know, we, we had heard before COVID-19, uh, up and down the state, the, the needs from students, the need from students uh, that they were hardly able to keep up with uh, with, with their financial demands for food and housing. We heard about food insecurity, about homelessness from students. And we heard it up and down the state and probably, probably even more so in community colleges than, than, than other segments. But that, that, you know, at first that was very uh, surprising to me because it certainly wasn't the case when I was a student, you know, way back 40 years ago. But it is a, 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 a need that students are facing all over. So 
the legislation that we were proposing uh, in, in uh, reforming financial aid was a response to that so that financial aid could help with what we saw the real cost of going to school and that was part of food, housing and transportation. Unfortunately, with the budget situation uh, that COVID-19, that, that was stalled. Um, but it's certainly something that's needed. We know now too that COVID-19 probably even has more demands on students. I heard from San Jose Community College um, that the, the amount of, of um, emergency assistance that they've given out, um, you know, went very quickly. Uh, we've seen uh, philanthropic groups come up with money to help students through the COVID-19 uh, crisis, and that money has been gone in hours. So we, we, we know the real need of students, and, uh, and, and we're, hopefully we'll be able to try to do something to, uh, to alleviate that need. Thank you, Assemblymember. Uh, just a couple more questions to go. Um, the next question is, you have worked with many diverse groups of individuals and stakeholders. How has your vision changed in bringing people together to transform education in California? Well, I, I, I you know, educator for, for many, many years, and now a policymaker in Sacramento. It, it, it seems like to me that education, maybe unfortunately, and you, you are all of you students of public policy making in the field of education, uh, is difficult. Um, I, I've heard uh, that education, the education institutions being described as, as a ship, a ship, a ship at sea, and that to try to move the direction of education is like moving a ship at sea, uh, that it, it's slow. And, and I think that has been my most uh, experience uh, in my eight years uh, in Sacramento, uh, that it's certainly slow in, in trying to change um, education. Um, some of the, the, I think the obstacles are, you know, everyone went to uh, high school and went to elementary school, so they all feel like they're experts in education because they, they went to school. I also saw a poster that said, you know, it's too bad that there are so few people creating policy um, in education that really have background in education. And I think that is also uh, very much true. Um, so not easy, not easy to, to change uh, education policy. Uh, there, as you say, so many stakeholders, uh, everyone, you know, um, giving their own opinion. Uh, but every once in a while, uh, people come together. It's true. Um, using ethnic studies as an example, uh, we had California School Board Association, California Teachers Association, uh, the California School Administrators, PTA. So every once in a while, we'll find uh, where all these different groups do come together, and uh, there, there should be an opportunity to make change when that happens. Thank you. Uh, just two more questions. Uh, we are work all working diligently to recreate the teaching and learning conditions that we had pre-pandemic. This is important, but it is also, also oriented to the past. What kind of advice would you give to future and current leaders about looking forward? Well, it's an interesting question of what, what happens, uh, say, in higher education uh, once, once we uh, get through this uh, this pandemic and how will it change? Um, I also uh, spoke to two Stanford students this week. Uh, they interviewed me um, for their school paper this week. And I mentioned that I had been on the Stanford campus uh, a few times and they said, well, that's more than we have. They were first year students and they have yet to step onto the campus at, at Stanford. Um, perhaps, 
Governor Brown had, had pushed very much for distance learning before. He saw distance learning as a way, actually, he, he saw it as a way to save money in higher education. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. Um, but perhaps when we get through this, we, we may find uh, that there are some value in distance learning. But again, I also hear from teachers, professors, that they very much, much, uh, very much miss the one-on-one -on -one or the physical contact and uh, what is lost in it. Um, so I, I know that there is a, a desire, especially from professors, teachers, to be able to physically interact with, with their students. Uh, teachers are sharing the frustration of meeting students for the first time and not being able to create the connections uh, that they've had with students in the past. Thank you. And our last question to wrap everything up, what is it like to be an assembly member? Um, and how do you decide what should be a signature issue for you? Well, uh, certainly being an assembly member is an opportunity. It, it is a, an opportunity to ch create uh, legislation to introduce laws. Um, as a classroom teacher, going from a classroom teacher to a legislator, um, I, I, I think one of the pitfalls of education is that teachers are not valued enough. That teachers' wisdom, um, intelligence, ideas are not valued enough. That too much of education is top down and uh, and teachers are not seen as, uh, you know, as, as the same way as a doctor or a, an attorney. Um, but now as, as a legislator moving from the classroom, um, you know, all of, all of a sudden, um, my opinion counts much more. Well, I, I think that uh, the opinion of teachers should be heard more um, and they should be, you know, they are, the teachers I think are the experts in education and that their uh, concerns, ideas should be listened to more. Thank you, Assemblyman Medina. We are so fortunate to have had you with us today. We are really grateful for your time. Well, thank you for having me here, Dr. Romero. Um, one thing I see though that we really need to correct is um, that's a very nice maroon colored shirt, but I think you would look much better in a stingers up uh, green CS Cal State shirt, and so we're we will fix that. <laughs> Last time I was on campus, which was right before uh, uh, the the, the COVID nineteen crisis, uh, I met with students from all over CSU on, at Sac State campus. But I, I look forward to to ha getting the uh, the Sac State t uh, shirt. We'll be sure you get a Sac State shirt. And again, thank you so much. We're so grateful that you would take your Saturday morning to come talk to us. And well, thank uh, you again. And thank you for all the work you're doing on behalf of Californians and Californian students. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, everyone. And join our next Leading with Justice series next week on Wednesday. Bye. <laughs>